The 21st century race for the moon is on, and this is already shaping up to be a fierce competition between global superpowers like we have never seen before in modern history. The first space race was fought between the United States and Soviets, and while the USSR might have been the first to go beyond the Earth's atmosphere, the Americans quickly punched back with a complete and total domination of the moon. It was a decisive win, a feat that has never been matched to this day. Communism is the very definition of failure. And now, in this chaotic decade that has been the 2020s, we are throwing a new one-on-one -on -one space race into the mix. Except this time, it's the US versus China, a late entry that has been making up for lost time at an unprecedented rate of aerospace development. And the Chinese are winning. Red Chinese victory! Impossible! Make no mistake about that, they are firmly in the lead. Now, this is not a sprint, it is a marathon race, and that means that the tides of fortune can still turn at any time. But this does make for an interesting moment to speculate about what comes next. What if NASA's grand plans for Artemis just don't work out? We've not exactly seen great results so far, and what if the Chinese operation continues to go exactly as planned? They've developed a very impressive track record for success. So, what happens if China takes over the moon? Let's talk about it. This is the space race. So, for one, this anxiety about China staking claim to the moon goes far beyond just YouTube hype. This is a major point of concern at the highest levels of the US government. During an interview in July, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said, quote, We must be very concerned that China is landing on the moon and saying, It's ours now and you stay out. And that echoes a famous statement by former Vice President Mike Pence in 2019 when he said, Make no mistake about it, we are in a space race today, just as we were in the 1960s, and the stakes are even higher. The key difference between the 1960s and the 2020s is that the United States are the ones playing catch up. Now, obviously China hasn't put human beings on the moon yet, and they still don't have any concrete plans to do that, but they do have robots on the moon, and that's more than anyone else can say. There's the Yudu 2 rover that was launched in 2018. That one is exploring the far side of the moon. That's the opposite from the one that we can see. We only ever get to look at one side of the moon because it's tidally locked to the Earth. So the moon still spins, but the orbit and the rotation happen in such a way that we can never actually see the other side. It's kind of trippy. But anyway, the U-2 rover is over there doing its thing. This is how we got that photo of what looked like a big cube on the moon, but it turned out to just be a rock. Or was it? We don't know. Maybe there was a cube, we have no way to verify anything that the Chinese are claiming to discover or not discover because the US and Western nations in general have no eyes on the far side of the moon. You would think that we would have satellites out there doing science stuff, but we don't. And the satellite that we sent on the way to the moon during the summer of 2022, Capstone, is having some major issues with communications and controls. So it's not exactly looking so great. China has a spacecraft orbiting the moon, though. The service module from the Chang'e 5 mission has now settled into a distant retrograde orbit, which is a long, slow orbit that takes it around the moon once every two weeks. The DRO is a very stable orbit that the spacecraft can hang out in for decades. And, speaking of Chang'e 5, that mission also marked the first successful sample return mission for China. Their rover collected a few pounds of lunar regolith and rock samples, which was then successfully returned to Earth by their orbiter spacecraft. This was the first time that samples from the moon had been returned to Earth since 1976. That last mission wasn't even the United States either, that was the Soviet Luna 24 lander. Even though the USSR never put human beings on the moon, they did land a few robotic missions in the 70s, which few people ever talk about. The Soviet missions only returned fairly small samples. The Luna 24 return was just 170 grams, 
but they did manage to dig about two meters into the moon's surface to get that rock. In 1978, the USSR Academy of Sciences published a report that claimed the samples from Luna 24 had evidence of water. Now, of course, nothing compares to the amount of moon rock the Americans were able to harvest with their astronaut missions. The United States laid claim to 842 pounds of lunar samples in total. But bringing things back on track here, the point is that right now, China is doing something on the moon that no one else is doing, and that's actively collecting new samples and analyzing them. The Chinese recently announced that they had discovered a new mineral in lunar regolith, a very small, transparent, and colorless crystal that they named Changisite. As far as we know, there's nothing exceptional about the new mineral, but it is still an accomplishment. And that's just the news that the Chinese have chosen to share with us. For all we know, they've been discovering all kinds of new stuff on the moon that they're just not telling us about, and we'd have no way to know. This is a point that NASA Administrator Nelson made at a recent International Space Conference on September 18th. Nelson said, Cooperation with China is up to China. There has to be an openness there, and that has not been forthcoming. Representatives from the Chinese space program were not at the conference to respond to Nelson's remarks. And in fairness to China, this isn't exactly a one-sided conflict. The United States has a law passed by Congress in 2011 called the Wolf Amendment. This actively prohibits the U.S. government from dealing with Chinese state entities such as the Chinese space program. That's why the Chinese taikonauts have always been barred from the International Space Station. It would have violated U.S. law to have the two space agencies working together. In light of that, it is hard to blame the Chinese for wanting to just go off and do their own thing in space and build their own space station and run their own lunar exploration program. This is why all of the biggest companies in the world were founded by nerds like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Steve Jobs. They weren't allowed to sit with the cool kids, so they went off and did their own thing, and that turned out to be significantly more productive. Also, just wanted to let you know about our Discord server. We've got over 1,500 members and host regular live watch parties within the community. We have some big events coming up for the first Starship launch, Artemis launch, and Tesla AI day. So if you aren't already, join our Discord server using the link in the description. The competition from NASA is heating up though. We can't deny that. Artemis 1 is slowly but surely making progress towards launch, and that is going to put an American and European-made spacecraft in orbit around the moon for a few days at least, and then it's going to come right back. So yes, there is an opportunity to do some science with Artemis 1, but the window to do it is pretty small. The Orion spacecraft will deploy some small CubeSats along the way to the moon, and that's great to have, but overall, Artemis 1 is more of a technical demonstration than a science and research mission. NASA is flexing the muscle of their SLS rocket and proving to the world and China that they can send something really big into deep space and then bring it back again. Then, if successful, they're going to replay that mission with Artemis 2, only this time with people on board. Again, there's some opportunity for close-up study of the moon with human eyes for the first time in nearly 50 years, but they're just doing a flyby and then coming straight home. So. It's not really until Artemis 3 that NASA gains the ability to leapfrog over China with 21st century lunar exploration. Like we said before, with sample returns, human astronauts are significantly more capable at doing science on the moon than robots. But Artemis 3 isn't happening until, who knows, 2025 sounds like a pipe dream right now. Maybe 2027, 2028. The point is, it'll be a while, and that leads us to a whole other problem. So NASA has picked out a prime chunk of lunar real estate for their crewed landing, the South Pole of the Moon. This is an area of the moon that's never been explored before. All of the old Apollo missions landed around the equator of the moon. The polar region is very much uncharted territory. For now, that is. Because, of course, China also has the Lunar South Pole in mind for their most ambitious mission yet, Chang'e 7. While Chang'e 6 will be another mission to the far side of the moon for a sample return, 
Chang'e 7 will be a large-scale robotic exploration of the moon's south pole. This mission will include an orbiter, a relay satellite, a lander, and a miniature probe that is designed to hop into lunar craters in search of water ice preserved in their shadowy bottoms. This mission has also been recently announced to include a new rover called the Rashid 2. This is to be developed by the United Arab Emirates. China will be helping with the landing, data transmission, observation, and control of the rover. So now we have two very powerful and wealthy governments working together on a moon mission. And while they are certainly not enemies of the West, we're not exactly great friends either. It's a big gray area. Much like the South Pole of the Moon, which is also where China intends to begin construction of a permanent moon base in partnership with Russia, who has become a much more clear and present enemy over the past year, and they are kind of terrifying, so that's problematic. And the Chang'e 7 mission that sets the groundwork for all of this is expected to launch in 2026. So the Chinese are very likely to reach the South Pole first, with the Arabs and the Russians in tow, and they are going to have a robotic camp set up there by the time an Artemis III crewed landing arrives. Now, that's not necessarily a direct conflict. The moon is really big. There's more than enough room for everyone. But when it comes to political posturing, this could complicate things. Would it really be possible for China to do what Bill Nelson has warned and tell the rest of the world to stay off the moon? No, probably not. But the fact is that they do have a very clear head start on the ground game. However, there are two undeniable advantages that the United States has on their side that China can't match. The SLS and the Starship. There is a big difference between sending little robot vehicles and microwave-sized satellites to the moon and being able to send a full-sized, crewed spacecraft to the moon. They're not even in the same ballpark. They're barely in the same sport. The SLS has the ability to send the crew-rated Orion capsule to the moon, and the Starship is promised to deliver 100 metric tons of cargo to the lunar surface, in addition to service as a human lander and habitat module. This is something that no other space agency has even announced their blueprint for, not publicly at least. China is working on the Long March 9, that's their own super heavy lift rocket. It's still pretty far out in terms of development, and it's not scheduled to launch until 2030. So as long as SLS and Starship are operating before the end of this decade, then that would put China back into playing catch-up. And while neither of these American rockets have made it into space yet, we can see for ourselves that they are both pretty close to being operational. SLS is probably just a few days from launch at this point, hopefully, and Starship is likely going to be at least a few more weeks, maybe a few months before its first orbital flight attempt. Meanwhile, China is doing engine testing for the Long March 9. Just last week, they successfully completed a hot fire test of a new hydrogen-fueled upper stage engine with 25 tons of thrust, one of the most powerful of its kind ever developed. And we know that the Chinese have already tested much more powerful liquid hydrogen engines for their core stage booster, claiming that they have a rocket engine with 220 tons of thrust, just shy of what the SpaceX Raptor 2 engine is capable of. And that core stage will be supported by four side-mounted boosters at 500 tons of thrust each. The kerosene-burning engine for those boosters was said to be completed in 2019. The Chinese have even proposed adding a fifth side booster to the rocket for crewed missions to the moon. So, can China take over the moon? Not likely. They can definitely get a very strong head start, and they can accomplish a whole lot up there in the short term. There's no denying that China will be the leader in lunar explorations, at least until Artemis 3, whenever that happens. But the real difference maker in the long term is going to be those heavy lift rockets. Like Elon Musk often says, there is no substitute for mass to orbit. Elon is pretty confident that he can build a city on Mars with a fleet of starships, so we can only imagine what it might be able to accomplish on the moon. 
the first HLS Starship might carry more stuff to the moon than every other lunar landing in history combined. That's going to be very difficult to compete with, if not impossible. China is good, but they're no SpaceX. So, if not for Elon Musk, we'd likely have a very different conclusion here. But as long as Elon and SpaceX pull through for us, we can probably say that the United States-led Western space programs will maintain the upper hand on the moon in the 21st century, though it will not be as decisive a win as it was the first time around. They have to commit to going there and staying there for the long haul. What do you think, though? Is there still an opportunity there for an American comeback, or do they take an L and watch China take over the moon? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.